We hear a lot of good-natured jokes about economists, such as that if they were all laid end to end, they could not reach a conclusion. <clears throat> but we depend on them more than we sometimes realize. For example, economic forecasts enter into the revenue projections that underlie the state and federal budgets. Our panel this morning consists of people who are all well-known community leaders and I will not encroach on their time by lengthy introductions. Ray Broughton is Vice President and Chief Economist for First Interstate Bank. Kevin Kelly is Senior Vice President for Corporate Planning and Development for U.S. National Bank. Lauren Weiss is an investment consultant and a member of the Governor's Economic Recovery Council. And Dan Goldie is a consulting economist, has held various state and federal positions, and operates a ranch in Central Oregon in his spare time. Our member, Dan Goldie, Goldie, will open the discussion, and I will leave it to him to outline the manner in which they will proceed. Dan? Thank you, Randall. Can you hear it? Can you hear all right? Um, I guess that's the last time we'll be called experts in your introduction. Um, our panel has been admonished by your program committee to be less entertaining this year and to be more educational. I guess, I guess they figure we couldn't invent any bigger jokes than our straight-faced discussions of the prospects for budget and trade deficit reductions and the benefits of tax reform. So if today sounds more like Economics 101 than you are accustomed to, blame your program committee. <laughs> this year we're going to change our format somewhat to minimize duplication of statements and to leave more time for your questions. I'm going to present at the outset the consensus forecast for 1987 of economists, not these four, but economists in general, on the national economy. Each of us will discuss the consensus forecast only to the extent we disagree with it. Rather, we will focus on our views of the Oregon economy in 87, each of us emphasizing different sectors. We will eliminate the direct questioning of each other, but rather will express our disagreements, of which there are some, with one another and commenting on answers to your questions. In general, the consensus forecast for the national economy in 87 is for more of the same. Continued sluggish growth in gross national product, an estimated 2.5% increase. This estimate of the private economists is below the 3.2% growth forecast by the administration, and that was what was used by the administration in their budget forecasts. As usual, there is a wide range of views that go to make up the consensus, with about 30% of the business economists believing we will be in a recession by the end of 87, and about 60% expecting a downturn by the end of 88. The most optimistic private forecast is for a 4.3% gain in GOP, GNP, not GOP, in uh, 87. <laughs> For those economists predicting moderate to vigorous growth in 87, the principal reason is their forecast of a significant decline in the U.S. trade deficit. They believe the deficit will shrink by about $35 billion due to the depreciation of the dollar against certain foreign currencies. Economists who believe growth in 87 will be very sluggish or worse are forecasting little improvement in the trade deficit which in 86 is expected to reach the astronomic heights of more than $170 billion. Most economists are forecasting a poor first quarter or a poor first half with the economy improving in the latter half of the year. This estimate is generally based on the expected impact of the new tax law. It is seen, the new tax law is, as having spurred consumer purchases particularly of durable goods such as autos, in 86's fourth quarter and borrowing from sales in the first half of 87. The tax law 
is generally expected to put a damper on business investment in 87 and to sharply curtail construction of industrial and commercial buildings and multifamily housing. In line with the forecast of an improving economy in the second half and a declining U.S. dollar, the consensus is for an increase in inflation from 1.9% in 86 to 3.2 to 3.8% in 87. With respect to interest rates, the consensus ranges from staying about the same to small declines. The declines would take place in the first half of 87 with some rise in the second half. The consensus calls for a small further depreciation of the dollar against foreign currencies, a 6 to 12 percent decline in housing starts, primarily in multifamily units, and a 5 percent decline in auto sales. The consensus is that the budget deficit projections in the President's new budget are way off the mark, and that the deficit for fiscal 87 will be about $195 billion, and for fiscal 88 will be more like $180 billion, rather than the Graham-Rudman targets of $154 and $108 billion in those two years. Finally, the consensus is that the unemployment rate will remain essentially where it is, averaging about 6.9 percent for the year. It is doubtful whether the economists whose consensus has been reported have taken fully into account the impact of the new tax law which makes fundamental changes or the potential effects on the economy of such recent events as the Ivan Bosky stock market scandal and a weakened president due to the Iran Contra scandal. Here in Oregon, we are about to install a new governor whose campaign was based on leading an Oregon comeback. Our primary focus will be on the outlook for Oregon's economy in 87 and what obstacles Governor-elect Goldschmidt will have to overcome to put Oregon on the road to recovery, prosperity. Ray Broughton will be the first panelist who will sound off on those subjects. Ray? Thank you, Dan. I don't quarrel with the generalized national um, forecast and we'll take Oregon from there. You know, January is named after a Roman god, uh, Janus, that had two faces, one facing back to look where they've been, one looking forward. Uh, I'll do a little bit of that, mostly looking forward. But in 1986, according to my numbers, based on 11 months of data, uh, we've had uh, an average, you take the 12 months, add them up and divide by 12, average of a million fifty-two thousand people at work in Oregon in the wage and salary category not the total, wage and salary category. That's an increase of uh, about 23,000. Looking back to the depths of Oregon's recession, that's an increase of 91,000, or 9.5%, which is nearly a 23,000 increase on average over that four-year period. We're still about 4,000 behind the record high of 1979. But there's an outside chance because the numbers are always revised, and with the exception of 1982, my experience in the past is they have always been revised upward by a few thousand. It's just barely possible that 1987 uh, will not be the year when we overcome the 79 hurdle. We may have done so in 1986. Looking at the year just past, uh, total manufacturing at 199,000 went down one. Uh, since 79 is down 30,000. This pattern is not too unlike the national pattern, I might add. Lumber and wood products picked up about 1,000 last year, but it's down 17,000 over the year. Uh, if we look at diversified manufacturing, it's off, off a couple of thousand. And where do you find that? Just where you'd expect in the principally high-tech categories. But if you take total diversified, it's off 13,000 from 79. High tech, it's zero. We're the same place we were in 79. Non-manufacturing had to bear the burden of the growth at uh, an increase of 24,000. That's uh, up 78,000 from 1982, the depth of the recession. Where does it come from? Well, uh, the growth has certainly not been in construction. Construction is still down 21,000. Won't help too much there, unfortunately. There's a big category called transportation, communications, and utilities. 
and in there you find the gains for the year uh, offset one to another with transportation showing the gains. No gain there. I don't know there's going to be much gain there in 1987 either. Trade always picks up a few thousand, uh, five, six, eight thousand. We're, we're up 25,000 from the uh, recession year of, of 82, but up only seven from 79. There's a big uh, category called uh, uh, finance, insurance, and real estate. That category is up about 3,000. It's identical with what it was in 79. And then we get into services, where the big growth came from. Take total services. And that uh, went up about 12,000 in 86. Since 1979, it's gone up 41,000. And this lends some credence to the people that say we've been trading high-value jobs for lower-value jobs. And I'll get into that in a moment. But the point is that we've got three service categories. One is hotel personal services, and that's uh, only about 25,000 jobs. And that's right about where it was in 79. There's really no growth. Health services, up 13,000 from the peak. And other services, up 28,000. In other words, we, it's these other service categories, not the ones that uh, are the typical personal services kinds of things in hotel, motel. But looking at their earnings, we find that in that one category of service, uh, uh, the uh, average weekly earnings, and these are 1984 numbers uh, against, uh, because that's where I have the detail. Uh, that's 36% of what people were making on average in uh, lumber and wood products. Health services, uh, that's been an area of growth. It's up 13,000 jobs since 1979. That's 22%. The weekly earnings are 76% of lumber and wood products, but you can find a wide variety there. Physicians' offices, $577, and nursing and personal care facilities, 167 So that's all lumped in there. Uh, other services, this includes business services as well. That's gone up, that's the big one. It's gone up 28,000 or 28 percent since 79. And uh, we find that uh, on average that's 63 percent of lumber with products, uh, jobs or earnings. Professional services, there we get uh, up into uh, well over $400. Uh, week, average weekly earnings are 96 percent. You get into the high tech categories, which is not services. The one that's been batted around here recently, and that is uh, an area where uh, since uh, 1979, uh, there's been a, an increase of about 16 percent, even with the losses. And uh, they pay on average, these are average weekly earnings, and there's a lot behind all this, but 5 percent more than lumberwood products. So you see uh, an area where some of these things are offsets. I look for 1987 to be a year of similar growth to 1986. And uh, without impinging on anybody else, I'll turn it over to uh, our Kevin next, is he, Dan? Kevin Kelly. Okay. Ever since uh, John Loriaga told me that he realized economists were people who were good with numbers but didn't have the personality to be an accountant, uh, <laughs> I've, I've tried to avoid numbers in my uh, forecast. Uh, Ray gave many of them, so I'm going to try and talk in general about my reaction to the national forecast, the Oregon forecast, and then I've been assigned uh, high tech and agriculture specifically. My biggest and probably only concern about the consensus forecast that Dan read earlier was that I agree with it. Um, and the problem is that many economists simply can't all be right. Uh, there is a tremendous consensus this year among economists. I guess the only uh, reassuring fact out of the whole thing is that uh, it's basically an extrapolation of the last few years, and therefore even a dummy could have made it, and, uh, or someone smarter than an economist could have made it, uh, so that it, it looks to be a fairly standard situation coming the next year, and it's hard to disagree with it. It's also fairly standard for what the forecast for Oregon is next year. That is, you're tempted to say, if you liked Oregon last year, you're going to like it this year. If you didn't like it last year, you'd better move. Uh, but that's not truly the case. I mean, the averages are probably going to look very much next year. Similar type of growth in employment, similar type of growth in incomes in Oregon. But I think the winners and losers might change a little bit. And 
I guess I'm just fortunate that the two I happen to be assigned, agriculture and high tech, may be a little bit more winners in 1987 than they were in 86. Uh, at least I think there's likely to be a slight change there. Of course, that was pretty easy, given that if you take those two industries, the last two years are about as bad as you can get. Uh, it'd be kind of hard to sit up here and say they're going to get worse. The, uh, I'm going to start with agriculture. And I've got a bias here. I was born in the Dalles, so I think of agriculture and cattle and wheat jump into your mind. I may be unique, but I think most people suffer from the same, I guess, oversimplification of agriculture in Oregon that I do coming from eastern Oregon. Uh, there may be a few exceptions on the coast and down in southern uh, Oregon who recognize what the true real crop in Oregon is, uh, <laughs> even though it isn't legally recorded. Uh, but other than those uh, folks who understand where the incomes are coming from, uh, you know, I, I think agriculture, we get deceived by looking at the, uh, the big three historically, uh, grains and wheat, cattle and calves, and dairy products. Well, I guess my test for today, the question is, uh, I just got some numbers from the State Department of Agriculture on the commodity sales, and the recent, most recent numbers were 85, so we got a pie chart on what the uh, shares of commodity sales of the different categories in Oregon were out of agriculture. And the test to the question is, uh, what was number one in 1985? And of course, the obvious answer would be one of the traditional big three, but the answer is none of the above. Uh, it was a category called specialty products. And specialty products, interestingly enough, uh, is not as diverse as it might sound. It includes nursery and greenhouse crops, Christmas trees, and bulbs and tree farms. So that it's generally an area that nobody, unless you're in that business, typically thinks of Oregon as being very, very strong in. And yet it was the one, number one producer uh, of commodity sales in 1985 for agricultural products. It's, it wasn't even on the list a number of years ago in this state. And I guess that's part of the message today is that we've got to look beyond. I mean, these are a lot of small businesses that have emerged in the last 10 or 15 years to create a category, if you want, that's generating the type of sales in the state that we get out of our traditional cattle and calves and out of our wheat and grains. Uh, it's also why you have such a mixed picture. I can't go through and forecast every crop, but generally the picture for the crops for next year is that it's hard to see any of them getting worse and most are likely to see good news. That is, cattle and calves have prices going up for no other reason than we've gone through five years of liquidating herds nationwide and it looks like supply and demand for beef is getting more back in the line. Uh, wheat, the uh, dollar change and the government program which is forcing the sales price of wheat down, the new farm program is pushing down the price of wheat, have bumped exports of white wheat out of Oregon 40% this year over last year. That type of increase, that type of export, not increase, but that type of export activity is likely to continue in the coming year. Finally, the specialty products, the fruits, the vegetables, all of those ought to have, barring a bad weather year, uh, continued improving sales, especially with the declining dollar and the impact we're getting in some cases on foreign sales for some of our, our specialty crops. So agriculture is really not a horribly negative uh, forecast, but you got to remember we're coming off of a very low base with the exception of maybe specialty products and some others. We're coming off of some very poor years. Moving to high tech, 1986 clearly was not a good year for high tech. Uh, in Ray's numbers, on average, last year, we lost 300 jobs a month in the high-tech field. Uh, so that if December looked like November, we're looking at about uh, uh, 3,600 jobs lost out of those categories. Uh, 2,000 of them alone were publicized very strongly on the Tektronix layoffs. We had probably another 1,000 out of Intel and just a handful of, of major firms. Uh, that is not just an Oregon phenomenon. That's a restructuring in the technology fields that's taking place all across the country. The demand for technology products is way down, and I don't forecast it to come back in 1987. There are some people who are suggesting maybe by the middle of the year or the end of the year, but I don't see it just yet. In fact, the restructuring has just taken place now, and I think the demand is likely to come back more in 88. Uh, so that, but I do see positive sites on investments coming in to Oregon and in sales going out. The dollar has changed things. Just this morning, ESI announced an alliance with a Japanese company for sales of their, their laser equipment. Uh, we've seen the Millersburg plan announced on NKK. That's likely to continue. The dollar has caused the financial incentives to come our direction 
and that's real positive. I've only got 30 seconds, but I've got one, I was supposed to bring up a caution, my worry about the coming year. My worry about the coming year is trade protectionism. In a broad scale way, that is, I hear simplified solutions coming out of Congress, and I'm very worried that we put some broad scale type uh, protectionism across the board that will stop our sales that are finally picking up again, particularly in the high tech area, and that will stop the investment dollars that are flowing one direction or another. Very concerned what it can do to inflation rates, interest rates, and the productivity gains we've seen in this country. In fact, my, my sort of one last line I heard the other day is what looks like in Washington, D.C. is you've got a bunch of economists who are, their forecasts are sort of saying, well, things could be a lot worse. And you've got Congress saying, let's go for it. <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it over to Lauren. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kevin. I would agree with uh, Ray and uh, Kevin that uh, Oregon goes back to the future in 1987. Unfortunately, it is the future that we were predicting in 1979. Uh, some years ago, I think the first meeting, I said that the wolf that we saw at the door had uh, a bitch at home, and I'm sure you will agree that it's certainly been one since then. <laughs> But I'd say that the real borrowing rates that we are seeing, which are the lowest in five years, will make 87 a pretty good year for housing and other rate-sensitive industries, uh, which will be good for our traditional basic industries. And yet, from the overconfidence that most of us had in 1981, Oregonians now seem to doubt that we can play in the economic big leagues, and I would argue with that. I think they are wrong. We have the classic retailer's advantage, which is called location which in fact puts us 2,500 miles closer than the average American is to the center of production and demand in the 21st century. Our prosperity now probably depends more on the existing trends in the Pacific Rim, which is the fastest growing economy in the world, uh, than it does on most of the rest of our own country, and our trade deficit has made them prosperous. So I believe that Oregon needs to concentrate on increasing our market share of that foreign trade with competitive rates, competitive facilities and regulations, and first-rate marketing. I would congratulate uh, Governor Atiyah on introducing us to Japan, and now I think Governor Goldschmidt uh, needs to concentrate on using his personal diplomacy to pull large exporters to Oregon. He is very good at communicating with businessmen. I asked Detroit about that. Uh, we often talk about how small businesses bring us jobs. In fact, small businesses do bring jobs, they grow jobs, but they often themselves sprout in the shadow of big businesses. And we don't have enough of those big guys in Oregon. Big companies also have, in general, higher average payrolls and also pay more in state taxes. So I think our new governor can leverage our location into creating more jobs by pulling some of those large manufacturing exporters closer to the Far East, which they want to contact. And a weak dollar has uh, set the stage for that to be a successful program. Long-term, Oregon needs to uh, think about how it can serve Pacific markets, uh, building the products that can be sold to Japanese and Korean and eventually Chinese consumers who have uh, many millions in people and eventually in savings to buy them. Can we package services and culture and knowledge like England has been doing for the past 20 years to keep from sinking? Uh, just knowledge alone is a product that we should learn how to sell. And I do not believe that there is a first-rate West Coast educational institute which includes languages and culture and trade courses that can serve the Far East market. That should be Portland State's first priority along with encouraging foreign students to attend our state colleges to build these personal bridges that are so important. The caveat I have is that this will cost a lot of money, and while past generations of Oregonians were willing to build the state that we now have, for some reason this generation keeps balking at keeping it competitive. Now how can we expect outside businessmen to invest in Oregon if we won't do so ourselves? Too many of us see our interests very narrowly, not past the latest tax payment. Uh, I think we do now have uh, an opportunity, and though I'll hate myself in the morning for saying this, I believe our legislature should break clear of this limitation by delaying the re-indexing of Oregon taxes to the federal law for at least one year. 
I think they need to come forward with a convincing program to justify that action based on building long-term prosperity for the state. I think it can be done and should be done. Now, beyond Oregon, uh, this little group gets together uh, uh, individually and as a group, uh, trying to think of surprises to entertain you. Uh, we are not as expert as the supermarket press that does it better with stories like Mother Bears Aliens Baby Ten Years After Death. But, but, we do, but we do try, and we seldom come up with surprises which make any lasting impact. Uh, the surprises that count are when something breaks that we've all taken for granted. Editorial writers probably warned us, but there are so many chicken littles around that eventually we stop listening. Well, it seems to me that 1986 was a year in which chicken littles became pundits. In January, uh, Challenger vaporized, and in May, Chernobyl played the Chino Syndrome without Jack Lemmon. And in October, contraception, or whatever we've decided to call it, reminded us that we couldn't even take Ronnie seriously. And uh, since December began, while we've been playing with our Christmas VCRs, the People's Republic is suddenly hearing strange things from the people. Uh, we did not predict any of those things, but neither did anybody else. But such shocks are really serious business. This uh, generation of Americans has been able to laugh in the face of uh, threats like deficits and arms control for the last several years and live to tell the tale. A new generation has finally shaken off the residue of the Great Depression and learned to fake it until you can make it and to get the financing together tomorrow after you've bought the goods today. And the heroes have been Don Trump and Ted Turner and Ivan Boesky. Well, 1986 was a reminder that there is a law of averages, that given enough chances, a monkey will type out a legible copy of I did it my way, and, <laughs> and spacecraft will explode. Uh, I think we should think about what other kinds of uh, things can, uh, taken for granted, will bite us in 1987. Well, I only have 60 seconds, I see, so let me uh, uh, skip all of the stock market business, which we'll come to in the question and tell you that I think we don't need to worry so much about the debt crisis, even though the debt crisis eventually will destroy us all. Uh, <laughs> I do think that we need to be concerned about the 30-month trend which has been going for shorter uh, interest rates. Uh, consensus uh, says that rates will continue to decline, and just because it's consensus doesn't mean that it necessarily has to be wrong, but this time I think it is. <laughs> Uh, a better economy is likely to force inventories up, and that will compete with the stock market and leverage buyouts for available cash. And even a weaker economy could cause the dollar to fall because of uh, rates rising in an attempt to fund the debt to foreign buyers. Uh, more likely, I would think that a decent economy in 87 can put rates up a half a point or more before year end, and that's where I differ from the consensus. Uh, finally, I will take the Celtics over the Lakers in seven games for the NBA crown. As you know, that fortunately has nothing at all to do with the stock market's direction. <laughs> okay, I guess it's my turn now. <laughs> um, first, with respect to the national forecast, which I presented to you, I am probably a little more fearful than my fellow panelists that we could slide into a recession this year. I don't think our trade deficit will fall 35 to $40 billion, although I expect Congress to pass new legislation that will have some impact on trade. Moreover, I think consumers saddled with enormous debt will slack off their spending, and I believe construction, which has been a big positive in the past, will be curtailed by the new tax law. It's difficult to see where any new economic stimulus will come from, and I see no end in 87 to the regional economic slumps in oil and gas, the farm belt, and the rust belt. What will probably keep us going along, muddling along at a subnormal growth rate, is the Federal Reserve Board's determination to ease money and credit as much as necessary to avoid a recession. That should mean lower interest rates and continued high levels of new starts in single dwelling houses and a continued boom in home remodeling. Now that's good news for Oregon's economy. We have had three successive years of record U.S. softwood lumber consumption and those high levels should be maintained in 87. As I forecast last year, 
only reference to being right for once, Oregon's wood products industry was a significant contributor to state employment increases in 86. But 87 is a good news, bad news scenario. The good news is that the industry has won its argument about Canadian subsidization of lumber exports through subnormal charges for stumpage. Canada is putting a 15% export tax on its lumber that should shift an estimated 2.7 billion board feet of production to the United States. If Oregon, as the nation's largest lumber producer, gets only one-third of the increase, it would mean about 8,000 direct new jobs in forest products this year and about three times that number in trades and services in our timber-dependent communities. The bad news, that's the good news. Now, the bad news is that the Forest Service is making an all-out drive to shrink the size of the industry in this region by curtailing sales from the national forests. The proposed new forest plans for this region would reduce annual harvests by 24 percent. In some forests, like the Sayusla, by 31 percent. This is in response to pressures from some environmentalists who want all the old-growth forests preserved for wilderness. The Forest Service doesn't go that far because it would virtually eliminate forest sales, an 80% reduction on the west side, and most Forest Service personnel. And of course, they don't, they don't want to commit suicide. But they are in the process of creating additional de facto wilderness areas by setting aside 1.8 million acres of old growth timber for spotted owls, plus even larger forest reservations for what they call minimum management requirements. It should be noted that spotted owls are neither a threatened nor endangered species. But if they didn't use owls to lock up the forest, it would be pileated woodpeckers or salamanders or some such. Moreover, the Forest Service is not waiting for the new plans to be adopted after public review, but is reducing current sales levels right now in anticipation of the plans. Hopefully, the Forest Service will be checked by the courts or by Oregon's congressional delegation. If not, we could see mill closures and rising unemployment in 87, rather than the job increases the market opportunities make possible. For this forecast today, however, I am going to guess our efforts will be successful and that we will get increased jobs rather than plant closures. Now, shifting over to my other assignment, in 86, we saw a further decline in high-tech electronics employment. But as predicted, a different aspect of high-tech came into sharper focus as an opportunity for future economic development. I refer to science research. The Superconductor Super Collider project has moved closer to funding by the federal government, and Oregon took further steps to select a site and prepare to compete. Wherever this $4 billion project is located, 3,000 top scientists will come with it. For Oregon, this could provide a critical mass of high-tech brain power that would have enormous spin-off effects. Whether or not Oregon gets the SSC project, the effort has paved the way for the kind of coordinated effort by our academic, business, and state institutions that could be crucial to obtaining other major science research projects. We already have underway advanced research at the Oregon Graduate Center in metals, ceramics, optic fibers, toxic groundwater cleanup, supercomputers with artificial intelligence, and new materials for new types of superfast semiconductors for the electronics industry. At Oregon State University, the University of Oregon and OGC, there are growing capabilities to do advanced research in biotechnology. This capability was developed primarily to stretch our forest, agriculture, and fisheries resources. Recently adopted federal rules concerning genetic research should facilitate the development of what could be a $15 billion industry in less than 15 years. More than $1.4 billion is being invested every year in the new emerging biotechnology industry. Oregon could aspire to a significant share of that investment given the head start we already have in biotech research. The President's new budget proposes to spend more than $20 billion for non-defense R&D in fiscal 88, 
of which almost $10 billion would be for basic research, large increases over, 86, over fiscal 87. I doubt that Senator Hatfield has lost any of his clout. And with the joint efforts of Congressman O'Coin, who serves on the House Appropriations Committee, it should be possible to flow more of these federal research funds to Oregon. But we've got to do our part for science research to spark Oregon's economic development, as it has done in North Carolina, Massachusetts, Illinois, California, and other states. We must assign the highest priority and make the financial commitments to give us top quality higher education facilities and top people. Science research properly nurtured can be a key ingredient in Oregon's comeback. In summary, then, the ingredients are there for an Oregon comeback in 87, with our economy at long last growing at a rate as good as or better than the nation's. We can have a healthy forest industry, expanding tourism, and agriculture that will not deteriorate further, and on this base can build further economic diversification. Whether this comes to pass, however, depends heavily on the new governor, our congressional delegation, and every one of you and us. Thank you. Now, first off, we've got Charlie Alcock, the board host, who's going to ask the first question, after which we're going to turn to you. And when your questions come up, you can ask, you can direct your questions to any one of the panelists. but. If you don't, I will assign them. And in any case, it doesn't make any difference because we're all going to disagree about the answers anyway. Charlie Olcott. Thanks, Dan. I'd like to go back to an earlier discussion we had about the healthcare industry and ask the panelists, um, in looking at the healthcare industry, which has been one of the fastest growing segments of, or of Oregon's economy in recent times, with the increasing competition we've seen, uh, we've seen increased pressures on cost containment. Uh, more wellness programs, more drop-in clinics, and so forth, whether we can expect to see major hospital closures in Oregon and accompanying layoffs. Well, I to handle that. <laughs> Why, sure, Ray. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to make a Tell point getting into do. that. No, no. <laughs> uh, you know, it's one thing to add value to a product and ship it out of state and bring it back. Uh, bring money back, okay? Uh, it's not all that different to provide a service, whether it's consulting or medical or whatnot, to people who are outside our borders who bring more money in than our people take out with them. This also is, is part of growth. Uh, the superior, in my view, uh, facilities that we have and the uh, physicians and other medical scientists in Oregon in various locations I don't think we're going to see a lot of uh, hospitals close. I think we may see some wings idled for a time. Certainly as you have people leaving the state as we did last year between July 1 of 85 and July 1 of 86, a net loss of maybe 32,000 people, that would account for that. But once this thing turns around, and I, and I would say a caution in the Oregon comeback, let's not expect too much of that program to materialize in jobs in 1987, I think it's more likely to be in 88 that we'll see the effects of, of the planning that's going on right now. But I don't see a, a wholesale closure of, of hospitals. Realignment, yes, but uh, not the closure. Anybody else want to take a whack at it? I, I think I agree. In fact, uh, hospitals, <clears throat> if you look at the hospitals, they've already undergone fairly significant in some cases radical changes with in decreasing employment in many of the hospitals, but subsidiaries created under the umbrella of medical services that have had job growth, whether it's uh, Good Samaritan with their uh, outreach uh, clinics by Washington Square or other places, or whether it's uh, the Providence Hospital groups and their uh, now more holding company form. So that I think we'll see a change in the type of medical services jobs uh, and maybe not the rapid growth we've seen for 10 years, but nonetheless, I don't, I don't see a, a declining side to it uh, in total, just a change in the mix of jobs. It's interesting to me to go through the various categories of medical services and find some that are going down in employment, but up rather sharply in uh, the, the uh, average earnings, uh, which tells me that there's an efficiency factor going on there, which may slow the job growth a little bit, but not the activity. 
There's a microphone right in the middle of the floor, as usual, and I'd suggest that, ah, fine, here we go. <laughs> John White, member. We've heard very little about inflation today. Uh, in the past, I think economists have told us that huge federal budget deficit will, will cause inflation, and we've had many years now of the largest uh, budget deficits we've ever seen. Uh, have the rules been changed, or when or where will we see the inflation? Let me remind everybody the consensus forecast, which means it's probably wrong, is that um, the inflation would go up in 87 from the 1.9% uh, in 86 to an estimated 3.2 to 3.8%. But uh, does anybody, I'd be glad to give a lecture on that subject, but anybody come first. A couple of comments. One, uh, uh, while the deficits in, in nominal terms are as large as you've ever seen them, in percentage of GNP terms, some of these years have not been necessarily records. There may have been one in there, but uh, we, in fact, have had declining deficits as a percentage of GNP in the last year or two, and it's forecasted for the next two or three. Now, that gives you very little hope when it's $200 billion. But nonetheless, it, it's deceptive just, just to look at the number. GNP has been growing uh, uh, fairly well now for four years, and the deficit has not been steadily increasing, but rather sort of flattening out and ticking down. Secondly, I think many economists had always argued that the way the deficits translate into inflation depended a lot on uh, monetary policy in the times and the, the current situation with respect to capacity and your ability to supply the goods demanded from the money put into the system. I believe strongly that we are in a huge overcapacity worldwide situation when it comes to produced goods, not necessarily services, but produced goods, and that it's not going away. And in fact, the message is the lesson we've got to learn is how to deal with the productivity side of things and get our costs down to compete on a worldwide market in order to get our capacity up. We're not even at the 80 percent capacity level in plant capacity in the United States right now. I have a very hard time forecasting an inflation in that type of environment uh, where there, there is the ability to produce, uh, but we're not producing because of the competition worldwide at anywhere near capacity levels. I'd like to let me just say one thing about that. Uh, what we've had is roughly 200 plus billion dollar budget deficits. And this year, as I indicated, in 86, we're going to have 170 billion plus trade deficit. So what we have been doing with those tremendous budget deficits is we've been financing the economic activity around the world. Uh, what we've been doing is, in effect, taking the, the stimulus that comes out of our budget deficits, and we've been financing the goods per, uh, built abroad. And we've had an enormous leakage here. And meantime, we've gone from the biggest creditor nation in the world to the biggest single debtor nation in the world as a result. I don't think this can go on indefinitely. How long it goes on, I don't know. But in terms of inflation, so long as we've got plenty of slack in our own economy and our operating rates in industry have been going down, we're operating at less, we're about 79 percent of capacity on an average in this country. So we've had a slack economy. Unfortunately, the economies around the world, the basic other the other big industrial countries also have slack now. They've got very low subnormal growth rates. And as Kevin said, we've got surplus capacity everywhere. And in that environment, you don't get much inflation. I could quarrel with the national numbers. I think if you take fourth quarter of last year to fourth quarter of this year, the increase in consumer price index is likely to be closer to 4 percent than, than 3.2. Reason, because we have not yet felt the impact of the reversal of oil or energy prices, which have been going down sharply, rising. And on the services side, those have averaged a steady 45 to 5 percent uh, growth rate throughout this past year. So that together you're going to see, I think, closer to 4 percent over the year than 3 percent. Jack Churchill, a City Club member. I'm probably one of those horrible environmentalists that uh, Dan Gold referred to. Uh, but I'd like to refer to the panel, uh, Professor Galbraith's comment when he was here in Oregon last year when John Kenneth Galbraith stated that uh, Oregon's economic development will always be key directly to its environmental quality. 
Industry and its workers are attracted to Oregon by the promise of its clean air, pure floating waters, and orderly land use policies. To what extent is it your view that the maintenance of our environmental quality uh, perspective from the standpoint of outsiders is important to Oregon's economic development? If I could make just a quick comment on that. Uh, the telephone company back around 19... Uh, 71 conducted a survey were people willing to spend more be taxed more to, to improve the environment and the answer was yes There's just no question about that way in the back page 17 was one question which said simply if it came down to environment or jobs which do you pick overwhelmingly the pick was jobs so i think we have to look at it in perspective in as much as i think jack's question was in part directed at my comments let me just say that as a former regional administrator, the BLM, former ONC administrator, I agree completely that Oregon has to maintain environmental integrity and the, the, the ambiance that makes living here very important and attractive. But unless it maintains its economic base, uh, people don't enjoy the environment very much on an empty stomach. And uh, what you can have is both. With sound resource management, you can have both. And what I'm quarreling with is the idea that in order to preserve, in order to do something for a species that is neither threatened nor endangered, and only six pairs have been studied, uh, that you're going to destroy the major source of, uh, uh, of Oregon's economy. Nedgers, member of the City Club. I want to address the little sister of forest products, the pulp and paper industry with Boise Cascade moving their paper group headquarters to Boise, with uh, Smurfette coming in and buying up publishers with James River, buying up Crown Zellerback. What is the pulp and paper industry facing this coming year? In fact, the forecasts for pulp and paper are very good. Uh, the paper industry has done well and is likely to continue to have a very good year in 87. Many of the things that you're making reference to are part of this, I guess, overriding trend in just about any industry you look at of restructuring and, and uh, uh, productivity issues. Now, whether they're actually creating any productivities or just uh, buying out one company or another or moving headquarters is a real question in my mind. But nonetheless, I think it's, it's, it, it is a, it's, it's interesting to note that an industry that has done very well for the last two years, they are still very conscious of the productivity side of the issue and are I guess bracing themselves for a different uh, uh, operating environment in the future. That's very unlike the 70s, where we were basically lulled into ever-increasing prices and people didn't worry about the productivity side of things whatsoever. Rather, how fast could I increase my prices to keep up with the CPI? Um, so that I think it is that those are overlapping uh, trends. It's unfortunate, I think, because in fact that industry is doing well and for Oregon to have to lose some of the uh, headquarters is a crime. Uh, I agree with Lauren. Uh, when we talk about small business creating jobs, that's fine and it's true. But this year in the high tech industry, we had the perfect example of how if our large businesses aren't healthy, they'll wipe out 18 times the number of jobs our small businesses could create in any one given year. Uh, and moving headquarters, losing some of the larger companies. That's my concern about it, is that it drops us down to a level that will take us years to make back from the small business growth we're getting. James Lehman, member. Um, my question is directed at uh, someone I'm sure who saw McNeil Air report uh, John Kenneth Galbraith uh, two nights ago and uh, comments about uh, his forecast or possibility of uh, uh, 1929 market problem. Um, particularly, I can't remember his answers. I remember one answer at the end. He said um, that changes in the rules, particularly in takeovers, he was talking about. And uh, he said that one answer would be to change the rules on takeovers or buyouts so that it would be slow enough that uh, there wouldn't be the huge amount of profit taking and losses that others are suffering. Comments? Lauren, why don't you tackle that one? I didn't see Mr. Galbraith, although I, it, uh, his comments were reported to me. Uh, obviously, the, uh, uh, the market's uh, extreme strength over the uh, last uh, few days is of concern. Markets moved from uh, 1895, uh, the last day of the year, to 
uh, about, uh, I think it was up 14 today, so we've moved more than uh, 120 points in uh, five days, six days. Uh, I said last year about the market, and I'll recall it, that while the fundamental uh, improvements and the improvements in inflation and interest rates were already in the market then compared to the valuation principles that we had been using in the 70s and early 80s, I reminded those who are old enough to have experienced it that there were two periods in this century, the 20s and the 50s, in which stock prices tripled from their lows. And they tripled because people began to see equities as a place not only to get a decent current return, but in order to make themselves rich. And when that happens, then the principles that have been used to evaluate stocks in the previous decade are thrown completely aside. And if we go through that once again, which it seems that we are doing, uh, trying to base current uh, equity prices on how much they were worth last year and how much the price earnings multiples were during the average days of the 60s and 70s is probably a futile gesture. People have a lot of money to spend. The Fed has been supplying more money than has been used for productive reasons for the last several years. That money has gone into speculations and buyouts. Uh, there have been a number of ways that these wrap-ups or uh, build-ups in stock prices work themselves off, and this is more directly to the answer to the question. We all know what happened in 1929. The market collapsed to 80 percent of its value, 85 percent, over the uh, following few years. However, those of us who really did live through the next time that the market got to extreme heights, having tripled from its bottom, do not seem to recognize that between 1966 and 1981, the market didn't collapse. It went sideways for 16 years when we were all saying everything has gone up in price, everything is going up because inflation is uh, 12 percent. Stock prices weren't going up. Stock prices first hit the 1,000 level on the Dow Jones averages in 1966, and they didn't break out of that until 1981. So when Galbraith uh, talks about the possibility of a collapse, that's one way these excesses are worked off after you reach the peak. The other way is to just go, go through a very long period in which the uh, enthusiasm evaporates. I would suggest we are going through the early stages of that in the real estate market now. I'd like to make one comment, if I may. Uh, there are two facets to the question that was asked. One, paper entrepreneurialism, this business of shuffling the financial instruments around in order to get control of companies without creating any new productive capacity or jobs or anything else. I think that's a real danger and a concern, and it also is a problem because it tends to exaggerate what is already a problem in American management which is to focus on each quarter's profits instead of a long-term strategy. And they do that in order to avoid people coming in and taking over their companies. The other facet of the question is addressed in an article in this morning's New York Times, and which uh, the columnist points out that over the past year, when we've had very slack growth in GNP in the United States and indeed in the European and Japanese countries, We've had enormous increases in the financial markets. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, 2.6 percent GNP growth in the U.S. versus 31 percent increase in the in the markets, financial markets, and so they're diverging. The financial markets are much more optimistic than the GNP growth would warrant. The question is, how far can it diverge before you get the two coming together in some kind of a violent form? And I think that's the hazard down the road. I think our basic economy has got to improve, or ultimately, this great optimism is going to get deflated. One, <clears throat> one comment. I did see the program with uh, John Kenneth, and uh, Larry Kudlow was the individual who was arguing against him. And interestingly enough, uh, as an economist watching it, uh, Kudlow had much better arguments than John Kenneth Galbraith did. And the interesting thing was Galbraith never said a sentence without saying, and I hope, Mr. Kudlow, you're not one of these people who's gotten caught up in the mania and can't see reality. And then every time he disagreed with John Kenneth, he said, you've obviously gotten caught up in the mania. So that seems to be the definition of getting caught up in the mania, is if you disagree with John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, in that sense, I, I'm caught up in the mania. Uh, he. The, the one issue where he did suggest, uh, the implication was limitations on, on uh, takeovers. As somebody who, in fact,'s job for the bank is mergers and acquisitions, 
and in a very small scale, therefore, takeovers, not financed by junk bonds, mind you, but nonetheless, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, I think a lot of people in the markets have missed the very fundamental reason and the simplest method of stopping most of this exchange of equity for debt, which is what it is. Whenever somebody takes over on these type of takeovers, it is purely and simply buying out the equity of a company with debt. The only reason for doing that from a financial standpoint is because of the way we tax equity versus debt. If you try and take your money out of a company through dividends, you get taxed, and you get taxed twice. The company gets taxed on the income, the individual receiving the dividends gets it. If you try and take your money out on a debt situation, you get to write the interest off on your taxes so that it passes through being taxed once. As long as that's the case, we're going to have people wanting to substitute debt for equity. The case where you get hurt and the reason it's dangerous is right now it's fine. Interest rates in long-term uh, bonds, treasury bonds have dropped to 7 percent. Short-term interest rates are even lower than that. In this type of environment, you can fund a lot of equity with debt. All we have to do is see those interest rates rise and you'll find how many of those companies can't support the debt. They can't support them now in many cases. They have to sell assets to pay the interest. So that it's a very dangerous situation, but it has nothing to do with whether we ought to get the Securities and Exchange Commission to stop mergers and acquisitions or whether the Justice Department ought to deal with antitrust regulations. It has to do with the fundamental financials behind the exchange of equity for debt. And as long as we go on taxing dividends twice and we tax debts the way we do, we'll continue to have people with an incentive to substitute debt for equity. Just a brief observation, going back to something Lauren said, I don't think it's a coincidence that we had 15 years of a flat market, essentially, nor that we had 15 years from mid-65 through 79 of uh, high and rising inflation. In inflation, you want things. And in periods of disinflation, you want non-things, intangibles, and I think this is what we're looking at. It's my personal view that we're looking at a long period, not just one of these brief periods when, because everything can go up or down and briefly, uh, of uh, low inflation versus the high inflation that we saw. There isn't time to get into the background for that, but that's what I believe. I think we've got time for another question. Okay, my name is Jim Sitzman, member of the club, and this question comes from the club's standing committee on land use and transportation. And the question is, after a decade, is Oregon's innovative land use planning program an economic plus, minus, or neutral? Got time for a question, but no answers. <laughs> 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 who, wants to, who wants to start that one off? Anybody? I will. Go ahead, Kevin. I'd, I'd say all the time. above. Um, and, I, and I mean that sincerely. In some cases, the land use planning program has worked exactly as it was intended. It has set aside land, it has gotten services to that land, and it's made it very, very easy to attract someone in uh, with a list of uh, viable locations. In, in other areas, they're still fighting original <laughs> boundaries, they're, uh, uh, they're tied up in regulations, and, and I still think it is hampered by uh, the inability to change in many cases and adapt to changes. Uh, the notion behind it is absolutely right. Let's get, let's get a, a serviceable amount of land so that we're not simply spreading services indirectly around and paying the high cost of it. But at the same point, in some cases, you can go around the state and find areas where they're still fighting over the boundaries, they're still having troubles. Uh, but in many of the metropolitan areas, it, it has helped. I want to, I'd like to add, as Looking at it from a standpoint of economic development, it has helped, the land use program has helped in that it has given a kind of an assurance about the stability of land classification to the people who come in to make their investments and want to come in to bring a new payroll, new plan. The problem basically in our land use, uh, our whole land uh, program, classification program, has been that there was supposed to be a goal nine an economic development component in it. And it was supposed to be based on local economic development plans. Those local economic development plans never really were put into place adequately. 
basically we had land planners advising the local communities, not economic planners advising the local communities. I was interested in the last can in this campaign for governor that uh, Governor-elect Goldschmidt put the emphasis on the regions and the localities coming up with their own economic development strategies and saying then the state would stand ready to assist them in getting them implemented. And that goes back to where it should have been. The whole land use planning program should have been in the first place. And I think that's going to be the correct way to do it. And I think it'll salvage and make uh, fully effective the land classification development program we've had in the state. <clears throat> Economics is supposed to be a dismal science, but it's encouraging to know that the participants can approach it in a somewhat lighthearted manner, even though it's highly serious business. Gentlemen, we thank you very much. It's been in keeping with a tradition uh, long standing, which I hope will continue into the future, of a very excellent presentation and a lot to think about. Remember that next week we have the legislative leaders here to tell us about politics now that we know all about economics. We're adjourned. <laughs>